Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Brian Wong. I'm one of your EMS fellows in the Office of Medical Direction. I'm an emergency medicine physician by trade and I currently work at UT Southwestern's Jean P. Clements Emergency Department. I'll be giving you a lecture on the management of acute behavioral health emergencies. So let's get started. So here's our agenda. I'm gonna be going over why does this matter, the definition of behavioral health emergencies, the debate between excited delirium and hyperacute delirium with agitation, the pathophysiology and derangements of the hyperacute delirium with agitation, history physicals and things to watch out for, as well as management. Here are objectives. By the end of this lecture, what I want you guys to do is to be able to recognize behavioral health emergencies, to understand the mechanisms and the pathophysiology of it, and to identify the high risk features of these behavioral health emergencies as well as implementing strategies in order to manage them. So I will be upfront with this disclaimer. There will be content in this lecture that will be disturbing for some of you. Yet this wasn't meant to be any politically charged lecture. This lecture is mainly for educational purposes only. And the reason being is because that I'm here to educate you, to empower you as medical professionals so you can hopefully take care of these behavioral health patients to provide them with the best possible care. So let's get started. Why does this matter? This is Elijah McCain. He was a 23-year-old black male who was a massage therapist uh, in Colorado. He was walking through Aurora in one of the suburban neighborhoods when a bystander called police for a, quote, suspicious-looking male wearing a ski mask and flailing his arms. In reality, he was just wearing his headphones and just dancing to the music, dancing down the street. So three officers stopped him and began a physical altercation. They utilized a carotid neck restraint and put knees into his back. He kept on stating that he couldn't breathe and that he was just dancing down the street. After the physical restraining, the, the paramedics came on scene and were told that he was, quote, acting crazy and, quote, was definitely on something. So therefore, the paramedics just administered 500 milligrams of IM ketamine for a reported weight of 220 pounds. And as you can see from this picture, he's not really that tall at all. He's only 5'6 and weighed 140 pounds. So after that, he stopped breathing, and then he ended up losing pulses, and then he died a few days later in the hospital. So in this case, this was a misrepresented case of a behavioral health emergency, specifically excited delirium. Um, and I put this slide up here is because that we need to be advocates for our patients so that we don't jump to conclusions and cause the patients any further harm. We need to be better at identifying and managing these behavior, potential behavioral health emergencies. It's kind of like when we ask you to do CPR, but you don't have your ACLS uh, certification, and we don't ask you to do trauma without ATLS. So why are we doing behavioral health emergencies without proper education and training? So this matters. This matters significantly. So I'm going to be showing you a video of a man named Paul Tereshek who was suffering from schizophrenia and EMTs responded to the scene after being called by PD. So let's watch. Hello? What's your name? Everybody's got a name? Yeah? What's, What's your yours? name? What's your name? It's okay. You don't want to say in front of the police officer? Is that I told him my name was Cliff. I tried to talk to him a few times. He didn't want to talk. Mm -hmm. You still? You want to write that. your name down? Can you write your name? Any uh, white? Any white? If it's an act, it's a pretty good act. Yeah. Because I see the same thing when I see a variety of drugs being used. Yeah. Now, if you're taking something, we're not here to judge you. What you been you taking? You don't get treatment. If you're taking anything, we don't get treatment for it. What you been taking? We all just want to make sure you're okay. That's all we want. So is that what, what they find him running down the highway or something? Supposedly, he was naked on top of the cab of a tractor. 
the driver said he picked him up and he doesn't know a whole lot. He can't tell us anything. Where are you from? This young man's not saying anything. You ain't got no ID? Hey, where are you from? Seriously, talk to us. We want to get you some help. I just want to go ahead to the substation and go to sleep. So if you tell me your name, we'll let you go so I can go back to bed. <laughs> I'm being fucking serious. I'm sleepy. Give me a damn name so I can go home for real. I'm tired. What happened to your arm? You've been walking? How long you been walking? That was from that damn blood pressure cuff that oh. she just took off. <laughs> Leave me alone. I'm sleepy Come too. On. We're all sick here, okay? <laughs> Please give me a so EMS was never able to obtain their name, and eventually they just released them. The deputy then drove Tarashuk to a different town 18 miles away and dropped him off at a closed gas station. About four hours later, this same EMS crew was called to respond after Tarashuk was hit and killed by a car. So in this case, as you can see here, the EMTs and paramedics didn't really take the patient's presentation seriously. He probably was hallucinating and clearly and not in his state of mind if he was just essentially not responding and whatnot. The crew had a chance to intervene and to get him the right care, but instead blew him off and it cost him his life. And so this is the reason why that behavioral health emergencies is so important too, because if you're not on your game and you can potentially blow off these presentations and these patients can seriously suffer, and in this case, it cost someone his life. So what are behavioral health emergencies? In the great state of Texas, since I'm from Boston and you know, I need to be able to pull up the laws from Texas, this is what uh, behavioral health emergencies uh, are. So it's pretty much any condition that requires medical attention um, and the patient will present essentially an immediate danger to himself or others. And also another caveat to that is that they are incapable of controlling or knowing or understanding any of the consequences of their own actions. These are what are considered a behavioral health emergency. So very broad terms and whatnot. And this kind of goes to show that behavioral health emergencies is essentially a spectrum of disorders. A lot of them can be psychiatric related too. So like anxiety related, it can be related to schizophrenia, it can be bipolar disease, but you can't discount any of the medically related stuff such as like substance abuse, hypoglycemia, thyroid storm, seizures, or alcoholic cirrhosis, the hyponatremia. There's a lot of different presentations and they're not all just psych or substance abuse. They can present completely calm and in a cooperative manner, which is aren't and essentially the majority of your behavioral health cases, but they can also be completely agitated, altered, and also violent. Which then comes into the term that most people know is called excited delirium. That is no longer the accepted term. Originally, the white paper report on excited delirium syndrome was created by the American College of Emergency Physicians. It was an attempt to describe this syndrome of excited delirium with some of the very limited scientific evidence that we have. However, there's been a huge controversy recently because of the fact that law enforcement officers were likely to utilize this term in order to justify the use of force and also forceful restraints, which uh, unfortunately itself can increase the risk of death due to positional or compressive asphyxia. So now the accepted term is hyperactive delirium with agitation. And there's a bunch of different sources such as the American Psychiatric Association and also the DSM that calls excited delirium an inexact diagnosis and has been disproportionately applied to healthy black males with very, very little science. So the American College of Emergency Physicians as well as the National Association of EMS Physicians have now accepted this definition of hyperactive delirium with agitation. 
So how does this happen? What is the pathophysiology and how does this actually happen, okay? We can think of hyperactive delirium with agitation um, in a way of a triad, okay? Most of the patients, when they come in, they have some sort of agitation and they're exerting themselves, whether it's due to drugs like cocaine, methamphetamine, that can increase the number of neurotransmitter release um, that can then lead to a profound hypothermia as well, too. So not only are these patients really agitated or exerting themselves significantly, they also get really, really hyperthermic as well. Their body temperature ends up raising, which then also leads to the acidosis and rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis being that there is an increasing amount of breakdown of your muscles. that, And then because of the breakdown of muscles, it releases potassium and all this other stuff into your bloodstream and also as well as lactic acidosis. So now you have this triad of agitation, hyperthermia, and acidosis and rhabdomyolysis, which releases all of this bad stuff into your bloodstream, which can potentially stop your heart and cause cardiovascular collapse. So this is a very unfortunate way of possibly dying. It's very important that y'all get a really good history and physical. The history is going to be the biggest thing to get. You need to get a really good history of presenting illness. Why do they present this way? Are there any other people around that can potentially get you collateral information? Sometimes there'll be family that are on scene that can give you the backstory of what's going on. You also need to know if they're taking any sort of medications, including illicit drugs such as cocaine, methamphetamine, PCP, but also get a really good psychiatric history too. Are they depressed? Do they have bipolar disease? Do they have schizophrenia? Something along those lines. And ultimately, what you want to do is do a really good physical exam, not just any physical exam, like listening to heart, lungs, and whatnot. You need to get a good psychiatric exam. And that uh, includes things like, are they agitated or not? Do they have any some sort of slurred speech? Do they have disorganized thought? Do they have any suicidal ideation? Are they aware of exactly what's going on with them? Do they have a disheveled look to them? Are they unkempt? Do they have, are they anxious? Are they depressed? Pressed, something along those lines. Those things there are really good and paint a really good picture of a patient who possibly might be having a psychiatric or behavioral health emergency. One of the tools that we can utilize in order to help us quantify if a patient is agitated or not because of their behavioral health emergency is this Richmond agitation sedation scale. It's typically used in hospital settings, but it, at least it gives you a numerical value on how agitated a patient might be and whether they need sedation or not, or if they're completely unarousable or if they're, you know, kind of like in the middle, it, at least it gives you some sort of number and gives you an idea of what type of patient we're dealing with too. Additionally, vital signs are super important as well as an EKG. Always try to get an EKG with your behavioral health patients because this can also give you and point you in potentially the right direction of what patient presentation and what sort of illness they might have. So some of the high-risk findings that I've already kind of went through in the previous slide, um, I'm going to be repeating here. Some of the high-risk findings that you might have in a patient with a behavioral health emergency is something along the lines of like a schizophrenia, bipolar disease, um, any sort of substance abuse, cocaine, uh, MDMA, ecstasy, something along those lines, but also your regular medications as well too, such as Abilify, your SSRIs, escitalopram, uh, something along those lines too, which can potentially increase your risk for behavioral health emergencies. As far as physical exam wise, you wanna pay attention to certain things like their skin. Are they diaphoretic? Are they super, super sweaty? Do they have really blown and large pupils, what we call them, uh, mydriasis? Things such as like agitation, part of like their psychiatric evaluation and their physical exam. Are they agitated? Are they altered? Something along those lines. The 
vital signs is also a really good, important indicator of whether they are in that hyperactive delirium with agitation, if they're tachycardic, if they are hypoxic, if they're tachypnic as well too, and as well as their EKG, like I said, if they have some sort of abnormalities within their EKG, such as a wide QRS or a prolonged QTC, something along those lines. So I talked a lot about the presentation of these patients. Uh, now let's talk about how to approach these patients. You wanna utilize a team-based approach, okay? You always wanna to try to utilize the resources that you have at your disposal. PD, FD, ALS, MedStar, all three of these organizations can try to work together in order to approach these patients and to try to get them the best care. When you're approaching these patients, use verbal de-escalation, and this takes a ton of patience. The majority of your cases can be handled with verbal de-escalation, non-threatening posture, tons and tons of patients. Try to talk them down from wherever they are. If need be, if the patient continues to get more agitated and to continue and continues to get more volatile, you can think about using things like chemical sedation or possibly physical restraint. It is a continuum where you start off with verbal de-escalation and escalate as need be to your chemical sedation and possibly physical restraint only when absolutely necessary. So when should we use physical restraint and or chemical sedation? There are things to consider when you are thinking about these things, and there are some pretty strict indications on when you would think about using them, and we'll go through them. The first things first is to protect the patient. A lot of the times, these behavioral health patients don't necessarily know what is going on with them, and they might have some sort of medical condition that puts them at risk if it's not treated in a timely manner. So in order to protect the patient, you might need to actually chemically sedate them. If they're getting extremely agitated and they're getting very violent and they're swinging, they're throwing things, you could potentially need to utilize these chemical sedation and also physical restraints in order to uh, protect the patient, uh, the public. Additionally, what you want to try to do is to protect the emergency responders from any further injury. If they are flailing, if they are throwing things, they could potentially hurt either FD, PD, or EMS, someone along those lines, and it could be very detrimental in that manner. In order to facilitate a proper medical assessment, you also might need to think about uh, chemically sedating them and also to potentially uh, physically restrain them in order to facilitate a good assessment and to potentially also allow for life-threatening injury treatment and also like illness treatment as well. So one caveat, I will say that EMS practitioners must never, never, never administer sedating medication to an individual in order to facilitate arrest or to assist with law enforcement in order to take the individual into custody. If the patient is already handcuffed though, that is a different story. PD does not necessarily need to ride in the ambulance with the patient. If it is all possible, it, they can, um, but at the very least they need to follow behind. And I will leave it up to the EMS providers in order to handle it by a case-by-case -case situation. So let's talk about medical sedation. It is considered medical management and it is not medical restraint. We don't ever use the term medical restraints ever, okay? And there are plenty of medications that we can use in order to sedate the patient, in order to facilitate protecting the patient, the public, EMS responders, in order to facilitate a good uh, assessment. One of the most common medications we can use is midazolam, Versed, uh, ketamine, and also haloperidol. The dosage of Versed is 2 to 5 milligrams IV slash IM. Haloperidol is 5 to 10 milligrams IV or 20 milligrams to 10 to 20 milligrams IM. And then ketamine would be 4 to 5 milligrams per kilogram IV. 
how do we utilize chemical sedation? So courtesy of the state of Colorado, this is how you can think about utilizing chemical sedation. If the patient is nice, calm, cool, collected, they're mildly agitated, but you can actually easily talk them down, you might not necessarily need to utilize those medications at all. Now, if the patient gets a little bit more loud, they're disruptive, they're distractible, but not necessarily an immediate threat, you can kind of chill them out a little bit by utilizing midazolam, haloperidol as needed. Now, if the patient is very severely dangerous, they're flailing, they're a huge threat, they're threatening people, then that's when you would think about utilizing ketamine because it has a very quick onset of action. physical restraints. It is the role of the law enforcement officers in order to control the patient with potential hyperactive delirium with agitation. However, as soon as the law enforcement officers are able to gain control, it is the role of EMS in order to recognize that this is a medical emergency and to assume responsibility of the patient. And I'll say that again. It is the role of EMS to recognize that this is a medical emergency and to assume responsibility for the patient. There will be times when law enforcement officers might utilize things such as a chokehold or potentially utilize a knee bar. These positions can compromise a patient's ability to breathe. It can compromise their ABCs. In patients with hyperactive delirium, they're five times more likely to be put in physical restraints and seven times more likely to die in restraints. So it's very important that when the situation is controlled to release these holds in order to allow the patient to breathe. It is preferable to utilize things such as wrist restraints and also ankle restraints if absolutely need be. So once we have administered chemical sedation and or our physical restraints, the biggest thing that we need to do is monitor the patient. We need to monitor their airway, 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 airway. If they're unable to handle their secretions, if they have any sort of airway compromise, we need to be able to and also ready to manage that airway. Check their breathing. Make sure that they have adequate chest rise in their fall. Airway and breathing. Make sure that they are able to breathe. Utilize your adjuncts, including end title capnography. Those things will definitely help you and are a great indicator to see if the patient is breathing okay. If the patient is still agitated, though, and there are times when you might need to redose your medical sedations. And above all, make sure that safety is your priority safety for yourself, safety for the patient, safety for everyone else around you and to continuously assess the patient. So now that we've gone through all that information, let's go through a case. PD is concerned about a 45-year-old male patient who is involved in a low-speed motor vehicle accident. He has no visible trauma. He is speaking a little fast, and he is saying that he's going to go save the world because of this new app that he's creating. When you ask him more questions, he states that he hasn't slept in three days and he bought tickets to Bali. When you're actually trying to examine him, he's actually pacing around really quickly, but he doesn't actually let you touch him or anything. So how would you handle this situation? Would you A, verbal de-escalate them with PD slash FD slash ALS as backup, allow PD to restrain the patient via chokehold and knee bar, C, allow PD to uh, place the patient in four-point restraints, D, five milligrams of IV Haldol because he's a threat to himself and others. You can go ahead and pause this and think about your answer before restarting it. Here's another case. PD calls you to the scene of a 31-year-old female patient who assaulted another person. She's flailing, clearly agitated, and bit the hands of the PD who is trying to physically restrain her. Her pupils are quite big, she's tachycardic, she's diaphoretic, and her speech is pressured and nonsensical. So again, I ask you, what are you going to do? 
Are you going to verbally de-escalate the patient with PD slash FD as backup? Allow PDFD to try to restrain the patient via chokehold and knee bar. Allow PDFD to place the patient in four-point restraints or give the patient five milligrams of IV ketamine because she's a threat to herself and others. Again, take a pause, answer the question before restarting. And finally, one more case. Your call to the dorms of TCU for a 19-year-old patient whom the roommates are concerned for. He's been acting really weird over the past months, talking to himself, insulating his room with tinfoil. He says that he feels like he's being followed. His vital signs are totally normal. He has no medical history. He looks a little disheveled. His thought process is tangential. So in other words, he's jumping back and forth between ideas. He's also having visual hallucinations, but he's not suicidal. He's pretty cooperative, though. So what behavioral health emergency is this? Is this major depression, alcohol intoxication, meningitis, or schizophrenia? Again, pause. Take a minute to answer the question. All right, so let's wrap up. What did we go over? We went over why behavioral health emergencies matter. We went over excited delirium and its controversy in its new accepted term of hyperactive delirium with agitation and how to properly manage these behavioral health emergency cases. Here are my references. If you guys have any questions, feel free to email me or anyone else in the OMD. Thank you very much.